allora adesso abbiamo il talk di un, di un altro relatore internazionale che si chiama Tal Melamed. Eh, purtroppo Tal eh, ha avuto un, un, un contrattempo di lavoro, per cui ha, in questo momento praticamente è su un aereo. Però fortunatamente è riuscito a mandarci un video del suo, del suo intervento. Tal Malamed eh, è, ha 15 anni di esperienza nel campo dell'application eh, serverless eh, security, e quello di cui parlerà infatti il, suo, il, nome, il titolo del suo talk è serverless security testing. Quindi prego la regia di mandare il video del talk di Tal Melamed o Melamed. Ciao a tutti, hi everyone. Um, my name is Tal, thanks for joining this talk. I apologize for not being able to um, be here live. Unfortunately, I had a work uh, trip. I had to take, so I'm on the airplane right now, um, landing in Bologna in just one hour. Uh, all right, let's start. So, What we're going to talk about um, automated serverless security testing. So I don't know if anyone, uh, if you all know uh, serverless, the technology. So we'll cover a little bit about that as well. And then um, we'll dive into how you should be doing security testing. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, So I started working in serverless in 2017, very early for the technology, just started uh, a year before. Uh, I started as head of security research at Protego Labs, um, an Israeli startup that did runtime protection for serverless applications. Um, the company got acquired by Checkpoint uh, in 2019. Um, after six months, I decided to take this to the next level and Uh, co-founded uh, uh, Cloud Essence, uh, another Israeli startup, uh, doing uh, security automated security testing for serverless. Uh, we got acquired um, last year by Contrast Security. Now I'm leading uh, the Contrast Security research team. Uh, team is based in Israel, but I live in Florence, not far away. Um, so I'm not here also to answer questions, but if you want, or you have, if you have any, feel free to reach me out at any um, channel. Um, let's start. So Cloud Native, uh, serverless is part of Cloud Native. Let's talk about that. So uh, actually, um, according to IDC, by 2021, which is now, um, 70% of newly developed uh, enterprise application will be developed as Cloud Native applications. It doesn't necessarily mean just serverless, but based on hyper agile architecture, we'll discuss that a little bit, uh, using containers, microservices, services, and functions, uh, serverless functions. Uh, Forrester already uh, see a um, uh, huge increase next year, and this is just uh, trying to, or going to grow and grow with time. Uh, the transformation to cloud native, I'm sure you all experienced that already began uh we're somewhere in the middle where we have the most advanced companies like uh, or pioneer companies like irobot and skyscanner which almost or tend to use mostly serverless and cloud native um and then we have uh along a little bit down the road we have big enterprises like coca-cola xerox att mastercards and more which already started this uh, transformation, but they are still in the hybrid part, in the cloud native part, traditional uh, monolith application, but it's going there. All right, so what is serverless or cloud native development? It's not just a development pattern, pattern it's a different architecture. It's a different arch architecture instead of a monolith with one flow, There are uh, multiple dozens, thousands, and I've seen application with 10,000 of different resources. Each is a standalone resource that is connected or configured in some way to uh, continue the flow. The cycles are not, uh, not uh, waterfall anymore. There are DevOps, 
DevSecOps, if you heard, super agile, hyper agile uh, flows. So the development process is really uh, fast. Uh, the processes are different. Usually um, it's less manual. So we don't have now a new version, a new server version that we have to now have maintenance time or, hey, now we release a new version. So we replace the server completely. No, everything is automated. Uh, something new, new needs to come up. The developer push a function to production and configure it to run as a blue green. So it starts with the old version, whether together with the new version and based on the results uh, that takes place. So everything is automated. Uh, and also the decision-making is different. It's not more top-down the, the director or the manager uh, takes the decision and uh, put it down or uh, give it down to the uh, developer. Developers have more responsibility. They have more uh, power, but of course, as well, uh, responsibility, security is part of it. And we'll talk about that. Uh, security is now, in many cases, part of the developer's job, not only to write secure code, but to understand security impacts in the cloud. Um, and we'll discuss that. Serverless architecture, as I mentioned, it's kind of a puzzle because uh, there are many, many different services. This is just um, an example of a single app. Uh, each sing each uh, component or each resource or icon that you see here is a different resource. So the orange one are usually lambdas. You can see here, these are databases and some other buckets uh, and some other services. Uh, in this case, AWS based mostly. Uh, but each of it of those resources is stateless. That means that you have to control authentication, access control, input, everything within each of those resources. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it, you can say, okay, this comes from a trusted zone, so I'm not going to do that. It's a risk you take, but fine. Uh, but you have to make sure that this entire flow is secured. And you not, don't just do it at the perimeter. You don't put a session and then, yeah, everything is sessions. Uh, I can um, take care of the user. Not always. The functions are stateless. They don't really understand. So either you, you maintain a state out of bound, maybe in a database, or you have to take some uh, security measures. And we'll discuss some of those during this talk. So what is gen serverless in general? There are a few uh, cloud providers. Um, AWS is the biggest one. Of course, I think it's roughly 60% of the market. Then you have Azure, IBM, Google Cloud, um, and some others. Um, uh, some of them, like AWS and Azure, and some GCP offers a lot of services, some just small services like function as a service you can find even in CloudFront, I think. Um, Alibaba has cloud and the other service uh, companies as well. But serverless just means a way of executing code, um, which is you don't have to maintain a server. The cloud will take care of everything, of everything apart from the code that you run. So when the code needs to run, uh, a container spins up by, by the cloud provider and runs your code. But you don't have access to the it's not it's not acting as a container. It just acts as a wrapper to the code. And then the architecture is more event based, so it's an event based architecture. Uh, it's not synchronous, so it's not re request response typical. You you also have that, of course, as part part of the system, maybe the APIs, but it's more event based. So something happened, and based on the configuration that we've done in the cloud this specific code will run. It will write to a database. And then because the entry base uh, entry was changed, then another code will run, process the data and upload it to an S3 bucket. Then because there was an upload to the S3 bucket, there is a service that pulls this data, process it, sends an email or whatever, something like this. Uh, most of the environments are read only, depends on the provider. In AWS, for example, all the system is read-only except from slash tab. So you, if you want to write data inside your runtime, just do slash tab. Uh, when the code terminates, so it uh, reaches the end, then this environment terminates. It's closed. You don't. It doesn't run anymore. 
it's not wired to the internet in terms of you cannot SSH to it. It's not that you don't cannot do uh, HTTP calls. You can from inside out. You cannot do uh, outside in. Um, so uh, inbound uh, data is temporary. Uh, basically, when the execution terminates, the data is erased. Data um, slash temp data, I mean, the data that you wrote. I put the stars next to it because you do not control that. Basically, if another uh, event is coming in, um, they might use the same environment. So you might have the same the data from the previous one of the previous executions, but this is not something you, you can rely on. Uh, the code resides in the environment. So when the code needs to run, AWS basically takes the code, put it into, inside a container, inside a, um, um, a container and runs it. So the code is inside. If you have access to the runtime, then you have access to the code as well. Also, the keys are also uh, inside the environment variables, which are also um, accessible in the runtime. And we'll talk about that. Uh, what about security? Well, not a lot. Um, you can see serverless computing is growing, um, and but security, serverless security searches or on Google, for example, is not really high. Uh, I can see mostly zero ones and maybe some picks with two. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that while it's just one, it's when I have to give a talk about it or something else, something like that. Um, okay, so we have this environment and we want to test it for application security. Um, or we want to understand first uh, how the application security that we've known before uh, applies to servos. Is it the same or not? So uh, let's understand some of the risks that we have in serverless and then try to uh, see how we can uh, assess those. And this is a function, Lambda function with, I don't know, uh, if I expand though, this maybe 25 lines of code, Basically, what it done, what it's doing is, it receives an event uh, when um, through an API, I assume, yeah, through an API, uh, and then uh, put this data, some data, into uh, a database. DynamoDB is a Dynamo is a NoSQL database by AWS. Put item is the action that writes date one entry into the table, the database. The table is inside the environment variable. And then just a response. Uh, what is the problem that I'm trying to solve here? That in order for it just to work, the developer needs to uh, create the right access or give the right IM uh, policy, so the permission for this specific function in order for it to work. Uh, the permission is a specific action and resource and service that you have the developer needs to choose between more i think almost ten thousand different actions so of course the service is dynamodb so it's narrows it down but it needs to understand what he's doing usually the developer will go to stack overflow or the documentation at least at the beginning until they understand and just put something that works uh, what we see in organization is that they don't want the developer to um, spend so much time on it so what they do is they create pre-defined uh, roles that the developer will use. Unfortunately, these roles are um, can be used or needs to uh, give the permission to the entire set of functions in the application, so they are very permissive. Anyway, what's the problem here? The problem is that the developer or the team that creates the role will create something like this, DynamoDB with a star, a wildcard, which means that this function now has action or access to do uh, any action inside the DynamoDB service. That could be create databases, delete databases, modify data, whatever, change the permissions, whatever it, 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 um, whatever action is possible within the service, even if the data, the database or the table does not belong to the application, but it sits on the same account, uh, then this function could, if you change the code or if you do something else like in runtime could do uh, any other activity while it only does actually put item uh, and as you can see the resources also with the wildcard means whatever table there is in the system in the in the cloud right so that maps to this and this which is bad because why do you need a wildcard with 
maybe dozen or two, three dozens of available actions when you only need one action. What you have to be to do is to find the right permission or the right access. In this case, it's called action. Uh, in this case, it's put item. Uh, set it just as this specific uh, action and give it the specific resource. This specific resource is the name of the table. In this case, now the function, even if you change the code or hack the function or in runtime you want, do whatever you want, you cannot do anything other than put one entry inside this specific table because otherwise a cloud will, uh, will stop you, the infrastructure. And this is one of the, the biggest challenges in AWS, mostly. Uh, yeah, here it looks, yeah, it's not so difficult. First of all, it's very an easy example, but the, the bigger problem is that it's a one function. Uh, I have a customer that claims to have 3 million functions. Of course, you cannot do this manually. All right, the other part of the problem is the loss of perimeter. That means that if in the traditional monolith web application, we had one entry point to the function, the, an API where you put that go through the load balancer or an API gateway or something like this, where you could put all your security controls. That's not the case anymore. Now in a serverless cloud native and specifically serverless environment is an event-based architecture. That means that the entry point to your code could be a multiple type of things. It could be uh, data analytics, it could be a file management. So you can upload a file to a bucket and it will run a code. You can change um, data inside the database, it will access a code. You can send an email to someone, it will write a code, it will execute the code. So you don't have just the entry point to start to, to block uh, attacks maybe. Um, and we'll see an example. All right, so what are the serverless risks that we know of? Uh, first of all, it's called event injection. It's like the regular traditional injection attacks, SQL injection, command injection, code injection, etc. cetera, um, XXC output inside. Uh, but now instead of just an input coming into the function or to the code, it's based on an event uh, input injection. So you have to create an event somehow um some sometimes it will be just but it will be created by the application but your injection should be inside this event uh broken authentication we talked about the fact that they are stateless so you have to find the right where the right authentication uh and maintain that sensitive data exposure of course in the cloud and inside the runtime of the function you have the code and the keys these uh, data is sensitive Overprivileged function, we talked about that. Vulnerable dependencies, SCA, yeah, everyone knows that. It's not new. Logging and monitoring, taking back from the OWASP top 10, maybe. This is just another way you cannot put um, network monitoring or put an access log. So it's not, it doesn't work the same. The logs are inside the cloud and you have to be able to extract them, monitor them report them, metric them. It's just a different way of doing it. Open resources, so misconfigured functions, misconfigured buckets, things like this. Denial of service, what control, um, I guess denial of wallet. So either you get DOS or you pay for the execution and insecure shared space, which is the data slash uh, the data folder that is could be shared between executions. Uh, and of course, insecure secret management uh, which could be let's see a demo um so in this demo there is one bucket file and one lambda function that trigger is triggered so executes whenever a file is changed or uploaded to the bucket the attacker is going to upload a file directly to the bucket through an api yeah but just to the bucket not uh to the code the bucket will execute the function the function is vulnerable so the file here will cause the function to send a malicious uh, to um, send the its own set of access keys to the developer, uh, to the attacker, and then the attacker from his own workstation now can interact with any service in the cloud based on those permissions. So this is why the permissions are uh, are important. If they are too permissive, now the attacker can 
still uh, data from the database, for example, even if the function doesn't actually interact with the database. Um, and this is uh, this is something that has happened, like the Capital One hack. So let's see, let's see a demo. I have here a vulnerable application. We'll talk about that later. Um, I opened here an HTTP tunnel just to be able to run something on my computer. In this vulnerable application, there is a feedback form that you can fill. And you can also attach files, right? So now I'm going to look at the network here. And when I upload a file, attach a file, sorry, I see that the file name remains. And I also get um, a URL that points me to an S3 bucket. It's a signed URL, so I can upload files to directly to the S3 bucket. Now I uploaded it. Now I'm going to change the function, uh, the file name to something the vulnerable that will exploit the vulnerable function. I'm going to do a curl here into my own tunnel here with the environment and with a command to run to capture the environment variables. And I'm going to wrap it with base64. And let's see what happens. If you can, you can understand that the function is vulnerable to command injection here because I can put a semicolon and run another command. And as you can see here, I got a few requests. I'm going to look at the second one and I'm going to see the base64 data. So now all I have to do is decode it, right? It's just text. So let's decode that. And I got all the environment variables. These environment variables contain the keys to the lambdas, or the keys that um, used by the lambda to access with the cloud. So if I'm using those keys, I am now impersonating to the function. Even though I'm running from my own computer, I'm from the application or from the cloud's perspective, I am the function until these credentials uh, are expired which is a few hours. So I'm going to write uh, this AWS CLI command. And you can see that I did F3 LS, which gives me all the buckets inside the account, even though they are not related to the, some of them not related to uh, the application. And I can go further and inspect uh, what files are inside. I can see a folder and If I get into the folder and moving on, I'm going to see that there are, so it's a dates folder. And inside that I can see there are, there are two files here. So now I'm going to do the API to well, the CLI command to get the specific file. So the bucket is the same bucket here and the file is this file. And I'm going to download it to my own computer. Now I'm going to read the file. Yeah, it's a receipt. And now I can also modify the file. So I'll just modify the file, modify the file, and then upload it back to the bucket. Uh, and we'll see in a second that this file exists. Of course, what I could do also is not just upload the bucket. Maybe I could uh, try to uh, understand what uh, other permissions I have in the uh, in the system. So the function has in the cloud. So maybe I can delete the bucket or even interact with other services as well. The problem with this security is mostly about scale. Not only, but mostly about scale, because even though services are uh, functions are small, uh, it's hard to scale that when you have dozens, hundreds, thousands, or maybe millions, I don't know. So lots of services that you have to understand how to secure them. Um, we hear about F3 buckets that are open, SQS, SNS that are open. There are frequent developments, right? So it's not short, uh, it's short cycles. So you have new um, new deployments um, on, a, on a daily basis, if not more production pushed uh, data 
sorry, code pushed to production on a daily basis. Uh, what services talks, what resources talks to what services, AppSec team or security team doesn't know that. It's really hard to understand. Uh, many developers, few AppSec or security team, it's hard to understand what is important when you have dozens, thousands of resources. Uh, and you have to understand also if the security is the same, as I mentioned, it's not exactly the same. You have the same attacks, but the entry point could di could differ, the impact could, dif could be different, the attack surface. Uh, so it's a little bit different. And if you have a problem in the cloud, who takes care of that? Is that developers? Is that the DevOps? Is that the security team? Who owns that? This is not something that is equal in every organization, and you have and you see struggles with it. All right, so we have this system that we need to secure. So we want to go left, right, shift left, have a security before we go to production, and we want to run our security tools. Does they there does these tools work? on serverless, uh, not so much because um, serverless has not just, and as I said, not just a perimeter front end that you can test. So you cannot run, take Zap or any Dust system, give it an endpoint and point it to an API and say, hey, start fuzzing it. It doesn't work like this. It will always get a response immediately, but then something st that starts a chain in the cloud. Uh, and something else will happen. Also, most of the functions, if you look at a big system, does not have URLs or endpoint. These are event-based. It's not something that you can target through an API or, or an endpoint. Uh, if you run SAS, it's a little bit different. Uh, most tools are hard to scale, especially on this type of environment, and they are very uh, disrupted to the development uh, CACD. Let's see how that works uh, in uh, state the traditional tools and apply them on a modern pipeline. So Mario, the developer, and Luigi, the AppSec team, want to run security, uh, maybe SAS, on the uh, on the code repository. But that requires a lot of tweaking from the security teams. Otherwise, you get a lot of false positive. And then they want to run uh, IAST, maybe. Uh, but then, yeah, IS needs co code coverage, testing coverage, uh, and the AppSec team needs to run that and to make take care of that. So they want to run Dust, but that hey, it's not you cannot really test everything with Dust, and Dust, as you know, needs configuration, and you have to run cycles. So mostly, Dust is not a CI/CD tool. No, I'm not saying it's not possible, but it takes a lot of work from the developer to give priorities, to talk to the AppSec team or the security team to, hey, we have a new version, now test this API, that API. So it's different. So how do you test serverless applications? All right, so this is uh, taken from AWS, an iRobot uh, architecture where you have one API and a few uh, services and resources behind. Let's see what I can do with this. Uh, all right, I can run uh, Sneak or uh, white source or black dock, any kind of SCA basically, or an image scanning, but that will cover basically 10% of my app. What about my, my actual custom code? Uh, those are, it's not that it's not good. It's something that you should do, but your own code and your own configuration are still at risk. Uh, SCA and image scanning is so, um, common that even the cloud providers uh, and many open source provide that. So this is a good start, but it doesn't uh, control your code, your services and your configurations in the cloud. So what about infrastructure as code? I've seen some of those coming up. Um, there are some good ones. Uh, Palo Alto uh, recently acquired um, Bridge Crew and there are some other good tools. So um, yeah, that's a good thing to do. It will find some misconfigurations or security misconfigurations in the cloud, but zero code coverage. Uh, it has limited visibility. It doesn't see anything other than the, temp the YAML file or something like this. Zero logic, zero prioritization, just text-based uh, configurations. So yeah, it's a nice one. It's shift left, really. Doesn't take a lot of effort, but you don't get all the security 
uh, the coverage that you need. So about about oh yeah, I asked. I asked is one of the mod, um, modern AppSec tools. It's very accurate, very, very dependable, um, but uh, reliable. But the problem is uh, that there are no servers. So it's hard to instrument a server when you don't have um, servers. All right, so let's run SAS, right? Static analysis. Well, SAS can see each resource differently or separate, it, but it doesn't work like this. There are uh, no, uh, in many cases, no uh, source uh, or sync that is based on HTTP. The code or the flow doesn't start in one place and ends in, oh, and start at the beginning of the function and adds at the beginning of the function. No, then there is an SQS in the middle and then this code runs. So this is one flow. Basically, SAS can give you a lot of noise uh, running. Uh, don't take my word for it, just try. Then Dust, right? So Dust can fuzz uh, this API. So maybe, maybe this code, not, not sure. Depends on if it's synchronous or asynchronous. Mostly just arrow inside, so it's asynchronous. Yeah. So um, Dust will not be able to fuzz anything here, not to mention this, 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 and that. All right. So it doesn't really work. Not saying you cannot get anything out of it, but it's a lot of work for uh, an effort for a little value. You need something different in serverless. Uh, so uh, what I would suggest is something different. I think that in the cloud, serverless application needs to be tested in a different way. And what we suggest is that a different, completely different approach to what you suggest. So you, you forget what you know from AppSec teams or AppSec tools, sorry, and try to understand a different concept, which is continuous, autonomous, and automated. So everything happens in the background. What happens is that you connect with three clicks that is possible with the cloud. Uh, then this service, or what we do is automatically discover everything analyze all the code, all the weaknesses, the attack surfaces, the flows between the services. Based on that, we create a specific simulations that relates to each and every one of those. And because we're inside the cloud, we can actually validate what we're doing. So if we say, let's try to upload a file, even if it's not allowed, I can then see if a file was uploaded because I'm inside. Uh, and then the nice thing is that apart from reporting it, still uh, we can still monitor it so co uh, continually monitoring it so if a developer now pushes a new code deploys new code new api we get that and we automatically scan that so you don't have to take to the out to the security team hey i built a new api um, it runs this code can you test this here is the endpoint or um, there is a new function can you test that no everything happens automatically in the background so let's see an example. The developer pushes new API that runs a function. Then what happened is that we'll notice that there is a new API. This API is connected to the function. The function then uploads the file to the storage, then runs the function, then sends an email to the user. What we'll do is that we'll scan each and every one of those endpoints or flow, and then we'll try to see where is maybe we found there is a problem. And after we are able to identify there is a problem, we can then extract the keys. Again, we're inside the cloud and then tell you what is your impact. So not just there is a bug, but also if there is a bug here and someone access it, you, they can access this table. This is just one scenario. A few, two years ago in Black Hat Europe, I showed how with my voice I can, in, uh, steal data from the database, just talking to Alexa. Um, this is available on, on YouTube. You can look for it. Behind the, the, the Alexa, there was a function, a vulnerable function. So this is just one example. So for example, if you have this policy, which gives a lot of permissions on a three in Dynamo, with an automated tool, you can just get the right one line of the just the actions that you need. And there, whether there is an injection attack or a vulnerable code, you can get the actual vulnerability and the impact for it. All right, so let's wrap up. 
security needs to be different in serverless security testing uh, and it can be much better in terms of how you operate things and if you want to know more and learn more about serverless security uh, there is an OS uh, serverless top 10 project which I lead together with uh, with other team members um, and working on this there is also an open call so if you have data like vulnerabilities, attacks, things like this in serverless, please help us. We are trying to build a new version for this report, but it's open source, so you can go and get it. Also, there is a open source project called DVSA, Damn Vulnerable Serverless Application, uh, which I created with some contributors, of course. Uh, you can use it, you can deploy it with three clicks. As I said, it's easy. Uh, so you just click click and it deploys it into your cloud please 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 do not deploy this on any account with sensitive information or production or anything in, uh, important because it's vulnerable that means that someone can steal these keys for example and access other services or other data in the cloud uh, that's it for today thank you again i'm sorry that i cannot answer questions um probably blended by now but i'm on the security checks or passport checks uh so shoot me an email catch me on uh twitter github whenever wherever you want uh thanks again and uh see you around bene eh, niente ringraziamo tal da da remoto